everybody thank you all for joining us um episode three isn't that great so welcome to broadening our horizons episode three of dolphins always know best and it's a series where each month i'm joined with guests to discuss the ins and outs of the topic under the umbrella of the climate crisis uh, this is a monthly series so be sure to tune in as the year goes you can find me on instagram at nylacat64 or our email address dolphins at alphanol.co.uk or this is something new our twitter account at dolphins no so today i'm joined by our guests dr esther Ngumbi and christine evans what a duo we have today a rising storyteller and a scientist your passions for what you do are unparalleled so let's get straight in. Esther and Christine, would you let our audiences today know just a little bit about who you are um, and what you do? Uh, yeah, I can go first. I'm Christine Evans. I'm an author of children's books. I live in the Bay Area, um, not far from Nyla. Um, I've written two picture books and a chapter book series, um, first two books of which came out just last, just this month. Um, the Wish Library, but the book that we're mainly focusing on today, Evelyn the Adventurous Entomologist, is a biography about a real entomologist from the early 20th century. Hi everyone, I am uh, Esther Ngumbi. Yes, I'm the bug lady. I study bugs, but uh, especially if you eat breakfast or you eat lunch, we all love our food, but we know uh, we have insects that want to also eat our food and so my research is uh, working to understand how are we going to have lunch dinner breakfast all the time without letting the insects have much of our food and we do that by using actually the natural enemy so finding a sustainable environmental friendly ways to uh, deal with insect pests so what we use is uh, looking at natural enemies and then also uh, getting help from below the ground beneath uh, the soil that you're stepping on we have microorganisms that work together with plants and plants are able to grow well defend themselves against the insects and uh, all while uh, storing carbon and so yeah I want to make sure you eat and you continue eating. And we all live in a beautiful environment as well. I think that's an amazing sentiment to start us off with. Uh, I want to dive straight into a quote that I really love. It's a quote from you, Esther, but I think it resonates with everybody. Um, because, you know, quotes are able to embody, you know, the deep knowledge, but it's also able to have such an innate way of captivating people, especially young people. So Esther, I, I quote this a lot from you. Um, it says, they can't be scientists if they do not have role models, people who look like them to emulate and facilities and to allow them to fall in love with science. I think this resonates with every single person ever because at some point in your life, you know, whether you're a little bug hunting three-year-old or you're an adult, you've thought, can I even do this? You know, nobody like me has, so why could I be able to do that? Um, and Christine, I'd love to branch us into Evelyn, but Esper, I'm curious, what did you mean by this? And um, what was your experience being a young girl who aspires to be a scientist? You know, were there any people you could look up to? So thank you, Naila, for a great question. Yes, I do passionately believe you cannot be what you don't know, what you don't see. It's hard to imagine. And so growing up, uh, in the Kenyan coast, I grew up without, first of all, actually, I want to say I wanted to be an accountant. And uh, why I wanted to be an accountant? Because the only people that I knew and I would see in my life were accountants. My parents would take us to, to the banks every end of month or when they were sending us to school. And I would go to the bank and I would see people seated uh, behind uh, the counter with clean clothes and they were sitting in an air-conditioned office and I said that is the career that is the most uh, amazing career and because I didn't know about science and then I did very well in my school and got actually um, 
invited to pursue a, a, a bachelor of science. So then it was the first day to go to the lab. I went to the lab and I started doing my experiments and I asked the question, I spread the hypothesis and I never wanted to leave the lab. It was just like, wow, this is what scientists do. And yes, it never was. But at the same time, all along my career, I realized that women were not many people like that look like me, people like that speak like me, uh, were not many. And sometimes I would doubt myself, am I really in the right career? Is this? And yet I knew how science was just amazing because I mean, you get to discover, every day I get to the lab, I don't know what I'm about to find, what discovery I'm going to make. And yeah. I, I said, why? why, why wouldn't they allow young students to discover science. Why wouldn't they have a lot of role models? And that's why I, if I can, I am out there and sharing my love for science because yes, guess what? You can be a scientist. And I hope that many of you that are tuned in, young people, please, please don't believe what they tell you that science is difficult, that science is not for women, that science is not for, uh, people that don't look like uh, the traditional uh, scientists that you know. Yes, you can. Thank you, Naila. Thank you so much for that. I think that was really amazing to start us off with that. I think that I I'm left inspired. I hope that everybody else that there's left inspired. Um, and bringing that in, so Christine, I don't think I've ever read a children's book that is written in such a way that I read it instantly and knew of the importance and of the legacy of Evelyn. You know, it's so obvious that you've spent time learning from Evelyn and, you know, you're passionate about Evelyn. And, you know, I think that Evelyn is such an important person to te tell the story of. But I was curious as to why is it so important to present this story to young people? You know, Esther talked about how it's important that, you know, you shouldn't doubt yourself because you need to see yourself reflected in others. And you've done just that. You have shared the story of a female scientist, a female entomologist, that you know she has changed entomology as it is. Yeah, it's an awesome question. I just wrote when, when Dr. Nagumbi was talking, I wrote down, you cannot be what you cannot see. So that is why I wrote that book. Like I wanted to inspire girls like my girls. So my girls are ages six and eight now, but they were what, four and six when I wrote it. And so I knew I wanted to write a book about a female scientist that people hadn't heard of, which you know had its challenges because if people hadn't heard of her, how was I going to find out about these women? So it was lots of Google searching and I found the story of Evelyn on the London Zoo website. And so it was so, and as soon as I found her story, I was like, like, how do I not know about her for a start? Because you ask kids to name scientists and there's been surveys done on this and you ask kids to, um, to name scientists and they will name, you know, mainly male scientists, people that, you know, Einstein, for example. And I'd never heard of Evelyn Cheeseman. I'm hoping that by telling her story, more and more people will start to name her. And there's so many amazing books out now, biographies of women scientists, more and more come out all the time. There's, um, there's one coming out soon about Vera Rubin, who studied um, astronomy. There's just so many women scientists that were hidden in the past that are now getting their chance through children's books, which I'm so passionate about. <laughs> and, um, getting to, and kids are getting to see these women in stories, which I think is so important. I feel like I talked a lot then. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I think you absolutely did because it, it is so important that we see ourselves and especially in science, because now we're trying to inspire a whole new generation of people who are going to be our next leaders. You know. I, in our first webinar, we talked a lot about how science is something that we need to get people into because we need to start finding these solutions because, you know, we have, we have these problems and we need to find ways to creatively find the solution. Um, and, you know, going back to Evelyn, she collected over 70,000 specimens. That's, yeah. that's a lot. That is amazing. And, you know, you read the, the book you wrote and something that really stuck out to me is, but Evelyn went anyway. And 
Uh, Esther, I know you mentioned this about how you just have to pursue through it, but I was curious for both of you actually, why is doing it anyway so important? Maybe we'll start with Dr. Ngambi and then we'll go to you, Christine. Um, but it's that curiosity. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, yeah, thanks for bringing about science. We are already in a pandemic and uh, truly science delivered in, a, in such a speed when we needed it. And you know what? Science delivers every day, every day. And that's why we also need a diversity of scientists because different people, everybody is unique. Everybody is authentic. Everybody brings them a, a, a different way of uh, thinking around a question, thinking around a, a challenge and a solution. And that's why I think we need to encourage many and do it and do it because uh, the solutions don't have to be necessarily uh, be discovered by just only one person. We know when given the, the opportunities, everybody is talented and everybody can come up with solutions. And you know, when we bring us a diversity a rainbow of scientists, then the solutions are most likely going to also reflect the diversity of the people that they are and we have. And because different also communities have different challenges that sometimes are specific. And if nobody is discovering from that, uh, part of a community or a race, for example, then how, how are we going to solve we, I do it and we need to do it because uh, the challenges of today require solutions from a rainbow of scientists. And I'll stop there so that Christina can chime in. I hope that's where books can make a difference too. Like Yes, it's Evelyn's story, but there's so many more stories out there where you can see the rainbow of science of people and hopefully inspire a future generation of scientists for sure. But that, that refrain you mentioned, Evelyn goes anyway, or Evelyn went anyway. I didn't actually get that refrain in the book until that in last edit of the story. And it's so powerful. I'm so glad it's in there. And I use that when I sign books now. I say go anyway when I sign the book to kind of say, like, don't take no for an answer. If someone says you can't go climb that thing to look for insects that cliff like in the book <laughs> go anyway and that's that was I'm so glad to pull that thread out of Evelyn's story because she did so many things so finding something that could resonate with kids who were reading it like to go anyway and so that meant in the very end I could pull in the child character in the very last spread I'm going to hold it up quickly so kids could then see themselves so then, then she spun, I can't remember, then she spun her stories into books, inspiring others to be like Evelyn and go anyway. Because Evelyn wrote books too. She wrote books for kids as well as, you know, scientific books, but she also wrote fiction for kids, inspiring them and um, science books for kids and her own autobiographies, which is how I wrote my story based on those. That's amazing. I remember through reading the book, I actually never, it never really kind of clicked to me, not only that it was her going anyway, but that it was also empowering somebody else to go anyway. And I think, you know, scientists, especially female scientists, um, you know, they endure a lot. And the amazing thing about Evelyn is that she was a nature loving girl and she decided to take a risk and she becomes a world renowned entomologist. And I think that's such an amazing message to spread to people, you know, both young and old. It's that it's about taking risks and believing in yourself. And like Esther said, it's about, you know, showing that rainbow and showing that whole spectrum of diversity. You know, because it's not just about one group of people trying to solve it. It's about everybody coming together and saying, you know, let's put aside our differences. Um, you know, we are all unique and we are all creative and we have the creative solutions and we have the potential. It's just about actually taking on the challenge. And so I was just thinking before we came onto the webinar, I was thinking that both of you have had such an amazing impact on people. Both of you have had the ability to show a new generation of people that they can and should follow their dreams. And I think that's really important. And throughout my webinars, I hope that each of my 
panelists and experts do have that same impact on people. And I know there are a lot of budding scientists and authors watching at home, I know some may be younger and some may be adults who've just found a new love for science or you know, writing or storytelling. And I was curious, what is something that you could tell us and you could tell us both as youth, but also as people um, to kind of follow our passions? Wow. So when you're an author, you get a lot of rejections along the way. And so that's my biggest um, piece of advice that I always give people is that you have to keep going when you want to pursue something, you want to pursue any dream. I'm sure it could, I'm sure it could be the same um, in any career, but yeah, the first time you put your work out in the world. So I send off some of that, the first query I sent off to an agent. That's how um, and my agents helps me sell, my agent helps me sell books. So I got an agent um, to do that. And you have to query them. You have to send a mess, an email with your work. So that's scary, putting your work out to a stranger to say, is this any good? Would you like to represent me? Um, so that first email I sent, and like that first time I sent my work out into the world was so scary. And then the rejections come and then you think, oh, why am I doing this? I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna get published. No one's ever gonna like my books. And, and you could stop then, you could stop and decide that wasn't for you. But the people who get published, the people who um, succeed in any career, um, but in writing um, are those that keep going. So it is about it is about talent and the creativity and what you um, do. But you can work at all those things. What you have to do is you have to persevere. So you have to have perseverance um, to be a published author. To keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I I agree with uh, Christine. You know, as I say look at me i grew up as i said i grew up in the smallest village and first of all if uh, where you grow up or you find yourself in can define you what you will become then i would not be here as a scientist and it has just because i persevered and, and as i said i didn't know anybody in the science world it took mentors people that took just a notice about my curiosity and they held my hand step after another even up to today i'm still standing on our shoulders of mentors and i think the one of the most important thing they say is persist and uh, yes you will find many roadblocks you will question yourself day sometimes month after month and you will wonder, is it, is it worth? But yes, it's worth it. It's worth every day. And it's important that we have many, many more scientists. And so I would urge you, if you in the vibe of thinking, I want to give up, reach out. You'll be amazed uh, at how many other uh, women scientists and are just out there wanting to hold your hand, wanting to uh, encourage you, wanting to clear that challenge that you thought you encountered. So do not give up. Yes, even science every day, setting up an experiment, sometimes we have hypotheses and we think this experiment is going to go this way. And then you do it, it goes the other way. And you know what? Actually, I get more inspired and I'm like, okay, it didn't go the way I expected. What else could? could be the outcome. And so that actually now makes me want to come back again and again, and now have like 10 other questions that have come out from this one failed experiment. And sometimes I always remember when I started being a scientist, it was day one, I had my experiment and uh, we had this set hypothesis, we had set predictions and we thought things were gonna go this way. You know what, yeah. things went the other way. And I remember coming back and I was heartbroken. I walked in into my mentor's office and I said how I didn't have any result. All the results were almost negative. And I thought he was just gonna be okay. Esther, you're not a scientist, this is not. And you know, he looked me straight into my eye and he said, you know, as actually a zero result, a negative result, it's telling you something. Yeah. Let's look at what it's telling us. And you know that 
it it was telling us something we changed the direction and before i know it i was able to get my master's degree and then i was like okay so yes science is like that every day we are thrown back i always say two steps ahead 10 steps behind and we persist every day so please persist i think that both of those pieces of advice are so amazing. And I think that sometimes you just have to hear it from somebody else. I think sometimes it's not enough to tell yourself, just keep going, just keep going. But when somebody looks you in the eye, like I said, and says, keep going, you can do this, you know, it's showing you something, you're able to kind of push through. And I think that a lot of the kind of um, resilience that you do get and that you do build actually comes from the curiosity as a child. And um, Esther, you mentioned, you know, growing up in a rural farming community and that must have impacted, you know, your work, not even your work going into this, but your work now, you must, and I know you've worked a lot in Kenya with a lot of sustainability and sustainable farming in Kenya. Um, and I was curious to hear more about that because, you know, your upbringing must have inspired you to strive for something and to go back there and say, okay, you know, now I have learned and now I, you know, I know so much more than I did before. How can I help this community? And, you know, how can we help this community? So, yeah, yes, definitely. And I, of course, I said I wanted to be an accountant, but yet in those early years, and we were farmers, so we would wake up in the morning before going to school, we'll go to the farm, tend to our crops, and we would work so hard and grow the crops. And then halfway through the season, you know, insects would come eat what we had grown. And I would also watch what insects, insects had then taken away drought wood. And then we would go hungry. And I would sit there and say, wow, we worked very hard. And look at these insects. So at an early age, also I wanted to understand why, wh who are, what, what are insects, first of all? And what, why do they eat away all our crops? And it wasn't only my family. I looked around neighbors, my community members. I later realized that insects were just not only a problem in my community, it was a problem in my country, Kenya, and in many countries that grow crops. And so I truly wanted to, uh, first of all, understand how can we control insects so that people that work so hard, people that put everything onto the farms are able to get everything at the end of the growing season. So that already had an impact and I wanted to truly do something so that my family doesn't go angry, my community does not go angry. And that set me already on a path. And also realizing also drought, climate change, that it was changing as, as I, I grew in the Kenyan coast. Early on, we would just, it was so hot. And then as I grew up, the seasons change. Rain used to come in April, it started not coming and crops would wither and dry. And so I wanted to understand how, how can my science, uh, how can I pursue a career? So once I kept on, going through my college and getting the knowledge, then for me, it was like, I must give back. I must return the knowledge. And because I knew I was so lucky, I was so lucky to be the first woman to get a PhD. And I wanted to return every knowledge that I shared. And that's why we have, a, today we have a, a farming uh, organization and we bring our knowledge we do it in our farms so that farmers can come and see and everybody that wants to learn we make sure that we give back and yes so that early bringing and seeing firsthand set me on a journey and i am not stopping until uh, everybody has something to eat every day food security is one thing i'm so uh, going to uh, continue fighting for because I think everybody has a right to food, period. So thank you. That was extremely inspiring. I think that as like a young person myself, I think that the upbringing and everybody's upbringing is going to shape them. But I think that the sentiment that you have to share your knowledge, you can't just learn and sit there with it because especially when we're talking about the climate crisis, 
we need to push to find those solutions and the easiest way to do it is to give back to your community you know whether it be a rural farming community in Kenya or whether it be maybe you live on the coast and you just go and you um, help the beaches right I think it's all about spreading that knowledge back and that's something that writing does have such an innate ability to share the knowledge back to share it to a wider group of audience um, and I think that and this is kind of one of the questions we have but you know Evelyn's story does teach us resilience and one of the questions we do have is will you continue writing more stories which inspire youth and I think that's I think that's a great way to kind of bridge that yeah I mean writing stories um, to inspire youth is what I will want I want to do forever <laughs> like for as long as I'm able to write these stories and publish these stories and um, that's what I want to do um, sometimes it will be through like a very obvious science subject like Evelyn, but also with other stories like my chapter book series is more about social emotional learning and how kids um, deal with friendships and school life. Um, I just want to give a shout out to one of my friends books really quickly. Um, this one is No Voice Too Small, 14 Young Americans Making History. Um, it's a series of poems about 14 different um, activists in the US and just hearing you talk about the coast, um, Levi Draheim, I'm not sure, Heim, I'm not sure I said that right, the rising tide. And um, so this one's about um, a child who lives in Florida and he um, sued, he helped sue the United States government for failing to act on climate change. So it was a lawsuit put together by 21 kids. So the books like this, like sharing stories, sharing these kids stories is is how we um, can make a difference with the climate change, I hope. <laughs> That's my hope, that stories like this can make a difference um, to inspire kids to make a difference and to inspire the adults in their lives to make a difference because it shouldn't all be on, on youth. It should be inspiring the adults and the government and people around us to make a difference. And another book I'm gonna mention quickly that I haven't got a copy of yet, but my friend Charlotte Offsay just released a book called The Big Beach Cleanup. And that's a picture book about heading to the beach and participating in beach cleanups. And that just came out, I think this part, well, I think it came out the same day as my books. So March 1st, I think that came out, the big beach cleanup. So I can go on for ages about book recommendations that to inspire kids at story times and in schools and in your houses. Um, it's a passionate subject for sure. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think that that's an amazing way to bridge it into diversity, because I know we have talked about how we want it to be diverse, but with the climate crisis, it is unfortunately targeting the global south, and the global south are usually the people who are doing the most to help us, right? And this does kind of bridge into us to what you were saying about how we need a rainbow of ideas and a rainbow of people, because a lot of the time we have, we've kind of got two sides of the world. You've got one side that doesn't experience it that much and are in a position where they should and can help. And then you've got the other side who are aware of the issues. They're the ones being impacted and they desperately do want to help. And most of the time I've heard so many stories of people who are actively trying to help. Um, I was working with some youth and they're doing such amazing things in that region. But I was curious, Esther, from your point of view, how can we be the ones to help? How can we amplify those voices that need to be amplified? Um, and also, what can young people do? Because obviously, young people, we're in a position where, you know, we're young people, we care and we want to do something, but we're really not sure how. So that, that's an excellent question. And I think, yeah, you're very right. We have, on one hand, we have here uh, the developed countries that are most uh, importantly the contributors of, of climate change uh, issues and you know with uh, the greenhouse emissions and whatnot and then on the other hand we have uh, nations uh, which I come from for example Kenya where uh, at least we they're not doing a lot of this uh, climate change uh, damage but they are bearing the brunt of it all and so I think it's important to acknowledge that too. And then at the same time, I know that uh, the people that, the stories that we hear, we are yet to actually showcase, uh, even some of, I would say, they may not be able to do uh, projects at such a magnitude. And because yes, they don't have that resources. And so when they try, it's 
sometimes it's hard to just even see the, what they are doing. And so I think it's important to acknowledge them and to be able to, if you are a young person, if you are able to, uh, if you identify a colleague, if you know somebody that's doing, even if it's a small, a small action, you know, amplify their voice. And I would say, I know myself, the way I was brought up, you know, most of, uh, it was just culturally not uh, to speak up as a, as a woman, as a young woman. I, 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 was, I was not speaking up until finally, you know, in my age, in my college days, that's when I felt very empowered and I, my voice all of a sudden got, you know, got amplified. But sometimes, yeah, there are cultural uh, reasons as to why, you know, they, the, the youth are not even speaking up and when they speak up. So just when you see that um, talent, when you see that little voice amplified. So I have a school in Kenya and part of me is to truly try to start amplifying their, 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 um, their voices and to show them, yes, your voice matters. I like that book that Christina, I'm gonna get it for them for the library and for all the students in my school to read it because, and you know, I know that sometimes they doubt themselves. Is, does my voice even matter? Does the little actions that I'm doing do even matter? But they do. And if each one of us can reach out to one of those uh, le le less amplified voices and start amplifying it. Can you imagine if what you keep amplifying and it becomes just if everybody amplifies and reaches another voice, oh my God, we would then have all these voices. So it's, it's gonna take time, but I encourage all of you, please uh, look out to those underrepresented voices, uh, magnify them like a microscope, bring them out and, and encourage them. It takes time too, as I say, it, it took a lot of encouragement from my mentors to know that it's okay to speak. It's okay to air your, your, your opinions, your Absolutely. views, they matter. So yes, I, I, I thank you for that question. I think I, I want to thank you for your response. Both of you have had such amazing responses. And, you know, each time you respond to a question, it prompts me with another question. I think that's exactly how all discussions should be. Um, and before we move on to questions, and also that this is just a reminder for attendees, we've got seven questions. I've got that's a lot of questions. Um, but right now is a great time to put in your questions. But as they're doing that, I wanted to also mention the fantastic book, um, by Dr. Tara Shine, and it's called um, How to Save the Planet One Object at a Time. And it's amazing because it isn't like a story, but you know, you flip through the book and it's got a section on kitchen items, it's got a section on gardens, and each of those sections you can flip through. It's even got sections on like clothing and coffee, you know, everything you can think of that you may have in your life, no matter where you are, it's got a section about it, and it talks about um how you know how you can help and what specifically is going on with that individual thing and I think that that's something that both of you were talking about it's about not just the big things it's about the small things what can you do you need to start being more conscious um, and I think that's an amazing sentiment that both of you have brought up like repeatedly throughout this whole webinar um, yeah so we've got a couple minutes so I think that we're going to start on some questions We've got a lot of questions and see if we can get through lots of them so we have okay no we answered that one <laughs> um so when I start with this question this is what has been your most exciting discovery and your biggest challenge I think this can be for both Christine and Esther depending on which way you want to take it so um I guess Christine do you want to go ahead and start with that Ooh. That's a good one. Well, actually learning and finding out about Evelyn was probably where I would put my greatest discovery because finding her in the archives um, and being able to bring her story to life for kids is probably, and that's what started my author career because that was my first book um, that was published. Um, so yeah, for sure. And what was the second half? What was the... The second half was... What was your biggest challenge? I think both of you definitely touched on that a bit. Yeah, but... I mean... 
handling rejections is always going to be a huge challenge and trying to separate myself from the work and realizing that they're not rejecting me they're not rejecting me Christine they're rejecting the work for whatever reason and there's a multitude of reasons for that too they could not they might not publish that kind of book they might already have a book similar they might not have you know there's all that you get a lot of different versions of projections <laughs> come in and they keep coming now even when you publish you keep getting them um I choose not to look at them so much now my my agent filters them but <laughs> they come into my inbox so much now um so that's definitely the biggest challenge is to keep going thank you and I think yeah rejections are part and parcel of life and I think Kristen you said it very well they they don't reflect you as a person they, it's just a rejection and it's just you keep moving actually I've seen sometimes rejections lead to actually amazing um, opportunities so it's always view a rejection as an opportunity it may be also an opportunity to step back and ask why uh, how can I improve the way I'm asking or framing this question how can I improve this article or or sometimes they don't tell you anything so please do not yeah as a scientist who writes grants who also publishes papers who does uh, reach out and I write also uh, opinion pieces I get rejections are part of my everyday life uh, and uh, so much, just the other day yesterday I was just nursing a rejection we had hoped to help grow our space salads and we were so excited but we didn't get funded and i was like you know what we'll wait and see how the reviewers are looked at our idea and how we can improve it so rejections are part of parcel of life ah on to my biggest discovery so it was while i was doing my phd it was just a side project and i talked about how be below the ground we get help from uh microorganisms the beneficial cell microbes and so when I started, nobody had looked at how actually once plants interact with this microorganism, what happens above ground. Discovered that uh, with this uh, interaction, the fragrance of the plant, plant chemistry changes, and the plants that have um, this relationship uh, with the microbes, all of a sudden they become decoy plants in that they're saying, do not come, they tell insects, don't come to me. There is somebody is eating me, you know, well, then nobody is eating them. They, be, they become smarter than, than the insects. And it led to, actually, we had uh, three US patents out of it and um, had companies uh, that work to formulate products that can be used for the farmers and so on. So that was just for me, it was, and I said, wow, you can, I did not know that I was going to discover something that was going to be so important that I was like, oh my God. So yes, as a scientist that, and you know, and that's why I keep coming to the lab every day because I don't know. And sometimes those discoveries are small. It doesn't have to be a big discovery because even big discoveries start from small discoveries. So with science, it's, we're building knowledge. And so the knowledge that I uh, give can be used by somebody to uncover a big discovery. So I view it as every day I'm contributing to the big discoveries of the day because those discoveries are built upon many years by different scientists that have worked to incrementally increase our knowledge. So yeah, that's, thank you for that question. That's actually amazing. I think that when you, when you start out, I think I've, I've seen a lot of things on this. It's when you start out, you never really expect to go anywhere, right? You're thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to hope to get there. And then you go a whole different path. And sometimes it's amazing where you end up. Um, and so we've had a couple of insect questions and I do not want to disappoint any insect lovers out there. So I was curious. Um, also, these questions are, have you discovered any new insects? Are there any new insects out there? And which is your favorite bug and why? And I think, yeah, just take it away. So I haven't discovered any new insects, but that's why I keep on going to the lab every day because you know what? I know very soon I'll discover one. And that's actually why I'm also working with um, 
I hope you know, to get uh, my science lab in Kenya working so that those students, actually the younger students can be the ones discovering, you know, what science is about mentoring and training the next generation because I want actually the next insect to be discovered by a young person. And I hopefully that's what, you know, because yes, yeah, so there's a lot of this insect diversity that's yet to be uh, discovered. And um, so the future is really bright for entomologists. So I haven't discovered one yet, but I don't want you to be the one discovering it. I want somebody young to discover it. And because then they'll be excited, inspired, and now they'll be like, okay, I want to discover as many bugs as I can. And then we'll be having many entomologists. My favorite bug, I have so many, all insects are my favorite. I love them differently. They're just like your kids because every kid is different. So I'll, I love, it's hard to pinpoint one, but. I love all bugs. So thank you for that question. I was wondering if, Christine, do you have a favorite bug? So I've always said butterfly because of the immense, you know, so much diversity in butterflies. And growing up as a kid, butterfly was definitely my favorite insect. But when we moved out here to California, the first insect I'd see, I found in our garden that I hadn't seen before was a praying mantis. And so that one, that that's come up with my charts to my one of my favorite bugs now because <laughs> they're just so cool to watch like, they're a very cool bug they are uh, and so we've got a quick question um which says that what can organizations do to encourage girls to pursue careers in science and i'd love both of you to answer it because both of you have two different perspectives you know one coming from you know the actual experience and another coming from the storytelling aspect so i'd love for both of you to yeah, well, you said it. Storytelling is definitely a way to um, inspire kids into science careers. Um, I think if you can get people to come into classrooms virtually right now, like I do also visit. So I visit kids all over the world um, virtually. The power of Zoom. I spoke to kids in Dubai the other week. Um, so getting scientists and authors um, into classrooms, I think, is a great way to inspire the next generation. Yeah, and I think, yeah, supporting outreach and, and just uh, because, you know, outreach requires microscopes, it will require uh, lenses, it will require every, you know, an insect net. And so supporting our kids and allowing them to just be curious and uh, if they are entomologists or a scientist, uh, finding you know, within the university institutions, there's all kinds of scientists. And I know scientists love outreach. So connecting with your local institutions, be it uh, community colleges, be it just uh, traditional public uh, land grant universities. And yes, and um, finding ways to support. And yes, uh, because it's important, all of us, everyone must do something and yes even the little actions so every action counts because we are racing through uh, numbers that are really low and a pipeline that has not changed for so long we still have 30 less than 30 percent of women are researchers that number has stayed like that for decades and it's wrong it's wrong in the 21st century to still have Let's scientists, we need everyone. So please, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, so we have, uh, we're gonna see how many questions we can breeze through. Um, so it says, um, for Esther, it says, why specifically did you choose to study bugs? I know you've mentioned that, you know, you have a disbelief that everybody has the right to have food and that drove you into science. Um, but why specifically did you choose bugs? So once again, because they ate all our crops when I was growing up and we did not have food. And I was like, no, you're not gonna take our food away. I'm going to study you and I'm going to find ways to ensure that you don't eat our food. Or if you eat our food, eat less. Remember that we also want to eat, share with us responsibly. So that's why I studied insects. But you know what also, insects are so diverse, I mean, from the ladybugs, to the praying mantis, to the grasshoppers, to the, oh gosh, to the caterpillars, to the butterflies, to the moths. Oh gosh, insects are like the, 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 the most dominant species and they stayed for almost 4 million years ago and they, they still are here. So 
Yes, and the pollinators as well. You know, pollinating most of the crops that we eat and our, you know, all the good things that they do. So yes, I that's why I chose to study bugs and you can study a different bug every day of my life and I will not <laughs> study them all. Can you imagine that? <laughs> that's how oh. <laughs> I think honestly that is completely crazy. I can't remember how many, but I'm pretty sure there's like approximately like 1.4 billion insects for every single person on earth. I think that is the most mind-blowing statement to think about. Um, but we are coming to the end of our webinar and I actually want to thank both of you because it's been so amazing and I've learned so much, everybody else has learned so much. Um, and if you've asked any questions that haven't been answered, don't worry, we'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Um, but before we do our whole end spiel, I wanted to, so everybody who are at home, feel free to drum roll because mark your calendars for not only one, but two webinars next month. So get your running shoes on and your bike gear for April 10th as I talk with Mike Elms and Rosie Watson, a duo who biked and ran solo and unsupported across Europe to Asia in search of stories of people who are living sustainably across the world. And mark your calendars again for our Earth Day special episode five on April 24th. I can't tell you much about this, um, but I guarantee you will want to sign up for this one. Um, also, we have our word search. Uh, our word search competition, we'll, we'll be finding out who wins a free um, Evelyn the Entomologist book, and it'll be signed, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, um, we'll be finding out on Monday the 29th. So please feel free to submit. We've had an overwhelming amount of submissions, um, there's still time left. By now you all know my goal is to get you all thinking, to bring out that curiosity and you know that curiosity is within every single one of you and as we've learned with both Esther and Christine, the only way we can look towards a positive future is if we start learning and then spreading that knowledge, you know, giving it back to the communities, giving it back through sustainable change. So thank you Esther and Christine, thank you all so much for tuning in. Stay tuned. I will see you next month. Bye.